So I know there's a lot of programmers in the room, but so I, I'd like to uh, give a little bit of hardware experience to those people who don't get exposed to hardware. So we're talking a little bit of hardware today. We're talking a little bit about lithium ion batteries, about uh, how you power these things, these magical wonders that we always, always like to use. But first I'd like to start out with a story of unintended consequences, things that happen to you when you're, when you're, not, when you're least expecting it. So yesterday, my wife and I were driving. We'd actually gone through, up through uh, Badlands, Mount Rushmore, and we came down from Rapid City. You go through, uh, go through Custer, South Dakota, and we were taking a trip through Custer and down to Lusk, Wyoming, and then wandering our way down into uh, Fort Collins. Well, this is the unintended consequence, which when you're driving along and you have a thousand miles that you've gone, you don't expect this to happen. So, where did it happen? Of course, right in the middle of nowhere. So, no cell phone coverage, 40 miles either direction, and I think it's been decades since the last time I changed a tire on the vehicle. So, get the manual open, figure out where the tools were, of course they're not where you expected. Figure out how to crank the tire down. Good news is, it was nice weather, we had a little drive area to turn off the road, and uh, everything turned out okay. And in, in fact, in Musk, there actually is a place to get your tire fixed. So it's just, it's just things that happen when you don't, when you least expect it. Interesting to see that's a six lug wheel. Yeah. It is. So that's a Ford F one fifty. By the way, that's new. Um, so challenges. So there are a lot of things. This is a, a discussion about. Power supplies that supply our calculators from the HP35 up to the prime. So what are the things that, that designers have to consider when they do a power supply? One thing is you want longe longevity. You want the thing to last at least a day, hopefully months, off whatever power source you're powering from. Uh, second thing is you, you've got you to reach compliance. You've got to comply to FCC, uh, CE, uh, all sorts of EMI, RFI rules. And so those are things that a designer has to consider when he's designing power supplies of a product. Um, thirdly, the device probably has rechargeable batteries. It may not. It may use some uh, disposables. But if it uses lithium ion, that's a real interesting topic these days. So, um, and then you have to fit into a small space. You know, I mean, that's the challenge is, and uh, as, as Eric knows, in designing hardware for calculators, Eric's always bouncing back and forth, do I use double A's, triple A's, do I use CR 2032's? Uh, so this is usually the place in my presentation where I say, never plug your HP 29 or 25 in without batteries. Well, it's a little bit different this year. So this is an unintended consequence when you have a Samsung Galaxy Note 7 and you plug it into your Jeep to charge it. This is, what, this is the uh, one in Houston. That was the went up. Went up. Oh, you're kidding! If you don't design your power supply situation appropriately, this is another unintended consequence. And as you probably all know, uh, Samsung has recalled all their Galaxy Note Seven. Say, don't use them, don't charge them. So interesting uh, fact. You know, it's, it's probably not the first time. Jeff's probably aware. If Jeff has flown a 787 Dreamliner. 787 Dreamliner. Boney had a little problem with their lithium-ion batteries that they stuck in their products. Uh, in 2013, they had fires that are occurring inside the airliners uh, in, the, in the equipment bay. And yes, the FAA went into uh, damage control mode and they went through a whole lot of design uh, investigations. And they in fact found that UASO, the battery manufacturer, they had to really redo the batteries, and then they also blamed Boeing for not significantly testing the batteries in the worst case situations. But they were smoking, they were catching on fire, and they've had to retrofit and uh, have new, new uh, batteries installed in the airlines. So you're all familiar with the hoverboards. The hoverboards, catching on fire, another lithium ion battery situation. Uh, Consumer Product Safety Commission has recalled I think half a million in 2016, and I think it's going up to a million of these. So, and then you see the Samsung recall. 
So what, again, what do you have to consider in, in doing the power supply considerations for handhelds? Uh, you have to look at displays, backlighting. These are all things that take up power inside of your calculator. And, and a designer has to consider all of these elements because these, usually these are the, the highest uh, power draws inside of a calculator, particularly if you have an RF or a wireless uh, communication. Uh, then it's battery size and weight. Am I using a lithium ion battery or am I using disposable batteries? Uh, then it's re and rechargeable versus disposable. Uh, you know, certainly with rechargeable, you've got to have a, a charging system of some kind. And then cost considerations. I've got to design a charger if I'm doing lithium, uh, or I've got to replace the disposal batteries, and then there's the cost of just replacing those. Yeah, one consideration not always observed is that when you're plugging your charger, that, that it has enough power to actually run the machine and charge. Correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you have to size your charger appropriately. So a brief word about batteries. So I found this chart on the web and I thought it was very, very interesting. So if you see things like cell voltage and you see things like temperature, here's the small operating window that lithium ion batteries can operate in. You can't charge them when they're too cold. You can't charge them when they're too hot. You can't, you can't charge them, overcharge them. And you can't let them deplete down to zero either. Yeah, that's a problem as well. So there's a really small window between probably about minus 20 to about 100 degrees Fahrenheit that you can really operate a lithium ion battery. If you've ever looked at, uh, if you talked to David about his Tesla that he's got, Tesla's got a whole cooling system around their battery system. And they've also got a heating system. If those batteries are too cold, you can't charge them. If they're too hot, they don't like to accept charges and they could get into thermal runaway. So if you see at the top right, this is not a good result. So lawsuits and death are not a good thing, right? Except for lawyers. That's, well, that's true. Then you kill two birds with one stone. So let's get a little bit into uh, battery. Oh, oh, by the way, here's an HP 19C that I bought off the web. Uh, you can see when I took it apart, it had a little bit of an issue. This is what happens when you leave your batteries inside your product too long. This is happens to be the power supply on the 19C. If you can see all the corrosion that occurred. And then with a little bit of a uh, little bit of vinegar and water, you know, things get a little better, and all of a sudden you got a nice clean PC board again. So don't leave your batteries uncharged inside your calculator. Preferably if you're going to leave it for a long period of time, take the batteries out. Yes. Also, I'd recommend a baking soda solution because that, that the buffer that neutralizes. Absolutely, yeah, after you clean it, yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Neutralize it, make sure you don't have any further reactions going on. Okay, so what kind of power supplies are we talking about? Well, we're really talking about power supplies for calculators, not nuclear power plants, not bench top power supplies, yeah. not server power supplies, but and not even plug in the wall. Devices, although those are also a critical piece of this. So we're really talking about the HP Prime and the HP 35. So this is really part of the power section on the HP Prime. And Tim Westman probably knows a lot more about the power supply, so I just gleaned about what I could. Oh, so Tim knows nothing about that. Okay. <laughs> but if you look at this, and I work for a company that does designs on power supplies, you can see some inductors here. There are a number, a whole number of power devices, and we're going to go a little bit deeper into this. Um, but just jumping back to the HP 35. HP 35 had a pretty simple power supply. So it had a toroid in here, a multi-wand toroid. It has some caps, it has some resistors, some transistors. It's a pretty simple circuit. And if you look that up, um, actually Keith Vanderson did a nice job of doing the, and Jock's Jock board has a great paper on this. If you look at uh, up some of Jock's uh, work that he's done, um, before he passed away. So, pretty simple, there's only three, really three voltage. There's the battery voltage, there's a VGG, minus 12, and an 8.2 volts. 
Pretty simple power supply, not too much to it. HP did a nice job. Um, and that's all you needed to run a HP 35. So, stepping up from there, getting a little more complex, and there's the three power supplies. You go to an HP 29. And so this is an HP 29C. There's the dotted board, identified as number two. And uh, that's where it's located. There's actually a, a monolithic single PC board version of this as well. So HP built two different versions of this power supply. Um, there's just a close-up. It has, uh, has the components identified. This is actually the oscillator. This cap, and, or this inductor, and this uh, cap is a, actually is an oscillator that drives the, the act or the arithmetic control unit on the device. Uh, but there's an inductor in here and a couple of uh, transistors. It's pretty much the same as the 35. Not too much different. I've had to generate an extra power supply because it's a, it is a uh, it is a continuous power. Uh, it wants to it wants to uh, wants to con supply voltage to the RAM as well. So there's a VSS, there's a V display, there's a, a battery voltage on here, a V bat, and then there's a VGG. So there's actually only four voltages that were really encompassed in this calculator. Still not too complex. Still basic. Basic same circuit, still a multi-wound toroid on this. It's just covered underneath a plastic. Oops. So now we jump to the HP Prime today. What are we looking at? So if you look at the PC board of the HP Prime, and this is a blow-up view of that, you see here's the main processor, here's some memory chips, but all of this is power, power control of some sort. So there's power supplies all throughout this chip. And there's quite a bit of complexity going on, especially if you look at the Samsung CPU that's on here. So just look at the Samsung. It requires six different voltages to run this device. So you've got low dropout regulators, which are just small linear power supplies. So you take the battery voltage, you've got two DC to DC converters that are, that are driving the Samsung chip, and then you've got a whole series of low dropout regulators. Uh, DC to DC are getting uh, high efficiency, supplying more power to the chip. <coughs> low dropout regulators are typically very small currents. Yeah, Tom? What, what's interesting on that diagram that many people might not appreciate, you know, the supplies you showed earlier had like two transistors each. Each one of those regulators has thousands Absolutely. of yeah. transistors. Each regulator, very complex <coughs> regulators. So. Um, and, and you're usually, and then you're talking about, well, these are usually standalone, there's usually an inductor, inductor coil that are associated with a DC, DC switching converter. And then you get into things like EMI RFI. The past uh, regulators, not too much EMI RFI, but now you've got to be concerned about FCC and uh, CE approvals. And when you submit your product to USBIF committee to be certified, there's, there's what they call an eye diagram. And you lift that eye diagram and you have to be within the envelope of that eye to pass USBIF. Otherwise, they won't give you a certification for, to be USB compliant. And that's pretty critical. And, uh, and that's why traces, layouts, things like that are very, very critical. So you can just see the, the contrast and comparison. Here we are with HP 35, four voltages. And we're seeing the HP Prime, 10 plus voltages. You know, anywhere from starting with a VBAT, a lithium-ion battery, to a, a VDD Alive, an ARM core voltage for the drive the processor, real-time clock, there's two USB voltages that have to be supplied, there's a, a RAM voltage, there's a display and backlight, I don't have the details for this, and, and then there's a charger voltage that has to charge, in fact, the lithium-ion battery and recharge it back up through the USB. So just summary and conclusions. You know, as handheld electronics become more complex, so does the power supply circuitry that has to drive them. And you see how much PC board space it actually took up. Uh, thousands of transistors, as Tom mentioned. Uh, storage devices and their charging circuits have to be carefully thought about. To make sure you don't exceed the lithium ion uh, requirements, either too cold, too hot. The nice thing is most of us don't charge our uh, calculators at minus 40 degrees you know, centigrade. Uh, and then the new power integrated circuits will be more complex to help charge these. But you're also going to have requirements for just the plug in the wall. Uh, there, there are European standards that are requiring those 
plugging the wall chargers to shut off if they're not being used, so they're not consuming power. And, uh, and some of the recent, more recent U.S. regulations have required redesigns for plugging the wall chargers so that they're not drawing power all the time. So just acknowledgments. Uh, a lot of people, including uh, people that are here, such as Jeff and other people who have given me uh, a lot of communications and, uh, and help on this. So I appreciate all the help that I've gotten and uh, appreciate the, the writing and the technical information. So any questions?